Hi, my name is Matt Dar. I'm a faculty member in Ag and Biosystems Engineering here at Iowa State University. And today we're going to talk about minimizing yield loss with accurate dry fertilizer applications. To kind of get this message queued up, I want to start with a, with a photo that is something we're more commonly seeing across Iowa which is striping in fields that is usually related to a uh, poor distribution of, of dry fertilizer products, uh, particularly as we're trying to get more product applied in a, in a shrinking amount of time. Uh, when we look at, at any imagery or data, anytime we see things that are happening in a straight line, things that are aligned with you know, traffic patterns through the field, uh, we know those are usually things that, that we did, that we created. And uh, so today we're gonna talk about what the drivers are uh, behind these types of yield drag problems, uh, how much yield impact these really have, and really focus on some tips, things to think about that are, are uh, best practices to try to reduce these impacts on uh, you as a, as a farmer, or uh, if you're in the ag retail sector, uh, reduce your risk of this happening from one of your uh, applicators or, uh, or machines. So when we think about what causes these strips, this in-field striping issues, uh, this is largely due to our ability to distribute fertilizer evenly uh, across the width of a machine as we're making uh, dry fertilizer passes uh, through the field. So I wanna start with a little reminder of the process of dry fertilizer application. Uh, here in the Midwest, we have two traditional methods of applying dry fertilizer. Uh, the first is with a spinner spreader, and spinner spreaders have been around for literally for decades and are the most commonly used applicator for applying dry fertilizer. Spinner spreaders use rotary motion to essentially throw particles, distribute those particles out away from the center line of the machine, and they don't spread evenly. You get more distribution near the back of the machine than you do at the very far edges. And so to uh, even out the spinner spreader application, we require or expect that the spreader will overlap so that the edges of each pass are adding up onto themselves and will uh, hopefully create an even pattern out the, uh, uh, at, the, at the end of the day. The other way we do this, and these the spinner spreaders, uh, again, have been around for a long time and are generally viewed as being you know, low maintenance, low cost, uh, high throughput machines. The other technique that we use is air boom applicators. And air boom applicators distribute dry fertilizer much more similar to a sprayer would, where you have a distribution boom and you have a metering system on the back of the machine. And it's gonna apply essentially the, the same amount of material uh, per each applicator or distributor on the end of that uh, uh, air boom. Uh, these systems don't overlap each other and generally, although they do a better job and are more precise in their application, they're um, uh, not as preferred by uh, many commercial applicators because they are more expensive, they have uh, some higher maintenance costs and risks, and, uh, and their productivity or their capacity acres per hour uh, is generally less because of the fact that uh, uh, you can throw material uh, farther than some of the more common uh, applicator widths that are available uh, today. So between these two systems, there's clearly some trade-offs and, uh, and, and the quality, how well we have these machines set up is really the driver to uh, striping that is happening in our, uh, in our fields. To kind of level set expectations, the, the way that we test or evaluate the application quality of spinner spreaders is through pan testing. And uh, pan testing uh, is, is time intensive. Uh, but is really required for every product every year across the type of application rates that are, that are run uh, through a machine to make sure the machine is set up appropriately uh, for those application rates. The every product piece is really important to consider here because as we're gonna talk about over the next 20 minutes, the product quality is a huge part, a huge driver to uh, why we need to check the spread pattern and make adjustments to the machines. I like to use the analogy of if you go from planting a flat seed to a round seed in your planter, you would expect to have to make some changes or adjustments, maybe to the row unit itself, definitely to the, the vacuum pressure that you're running. 
And there's a similar application here in, in fertilizer spreaders, that as you make major changes and adjustments to the type of fertilizer that we're using, uh, it's gonna be required that we uh, retest or pan test to help dial in that machine. You know, unfortunately on a, on a planner, maybe fortunately for a planner, we see that impact through the singulation data, through the display that's available to us in the cab, and oftentimes can make that vacuum adjustment on the fly. With dry fertilizer application, it's not nearly as visible on the machines. And so pan testing, which is more time intensive, is really required to help to identify those product quality uh, differences. Now, when we're pan testing these machines, uh, typically with a dry fertilizer spreader, we'd be, we'd be happy if the COV, which is the variability across the width of that machine, you know, if that's 20% or less uh, per pan, uh, usually that's a, that's a pretty good application. Uh, the reality is that's quite a bit different than a liquid applicator where we would say with, uh, you know, a sprayer and nozzles, we should be less than 3%. So, you know, these systems are, are probably never gonna really perform at the level of a liquid application. But with good calibration and the time spent to make sure that we're, we're understanding product quality, uh, they can do quite well in, uh, in target applications. <clears throat> so one of the things to think about as we think about this whole application or benchmarking um, uh, aspect of fertilizer spreaders is what we talk about accuracy. Are we talking about accuracy per acre, per row, per plant? What does that really mean to us? And historically, when we've talked about fertilizer accuracy, it's been by the acre or the field level. You know, you order 10 tons of fertilizer for a field, you would expect that there's 10 tons that are applied to that field. Um, with the use of aerial imagery, particularly drones today, and the ability to see differences in the field much easier, it's forcing us to really think about what is our, our fertilizer distribution accuracy on a row by row level because those row by row differences are really what creates these striking or streaking patterns within the, uh, within the field that are, uh, that are visible to us. And if we think about nitrogen in particular, it's, it's sort of easier to think about nitrogen in terms of a yield response than maybe uh, phosphorus and potassium. Um, if we have a 20% COV, which again, I would say is really a, a pretty well set up machine and we're applying 100 pounds per acre of, of urea, what that really means from a statistical standpoint is that 68% of our rows, essentially you know, two thirds of our rows, have an actual application rate between 80 to 120 pounds. So I may or may not see a yield difference there. 95% of my rows, you know, almost my whole planter, is gonna have some rows that are as low as 60 pounds and some as high as 140 pounds. And so that is what starts to cause the, the striping, the visible, uh, nutrient deficiency response in those uh, in those arrow images. So with spinner spreaders, there's essentially three types of of common patterns that we see, and all of these can create different levels of of striping. the uh, The image up on this on the uh, the slide here is straight out of some some user manuals for how to set up and 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 walk through the calibration process, and and so are, are common things that we should look for when we're we're doing pan testing. The first one is where we've got a really heavy pattern directly behind the, uh, uh, the vehicle. And this is often associated with a poor spinner spreader setting, or um, if we've got really bad material quality, if you've got ground up or, or uh, you know, you've got the last scoop of fertilizer off the floor of the, of the building, uh, a lot more fines, you're going to see that center heavy uh, pattern. The one in the middle is also very common where you've got maybe a light pattern behind the machine, um, pretty heavy patterns out to the side. And the last one is I mean, the second one we call an M shape because it's sort of looks like an M. And, and the last one is a W shape pattern where we get a, a high output from the, from the center of the machine. We get um, some dips along the, you know, sort of the 10 to 20 feet uh, outside of the machine uh, pattern and then a higher distribution at the end. Uh, over the last you know, handful of years, we've seen all of these types of issues pop up within the state of Iowa in terms of, of uh, uh, insurance claims or, or complaints in terms of product quality and application. Um, you know, I would say from a, from a common perspective, the, the things that most commonly uh, show up are uh, something that looks kind of like the first one where we're not able to really spread it far enough. Maybe we're trying to 
you know, spread, we set the swath width of the machine to 100 feet, but we can only get that fertilizer 90 feet. And so, you know, we're going to have a, you know, a 10 foot gap between those swaths uh, with low, low application. That's been fairly common. Uh, I would say the uh, other issues where you've got uh, pattern issues directly behind the machine have also been uh, uh, fairly common and, and just more visible today with the use of uh, uh, UAVs. So I want to put this in context a little bit of like what do we what do we mean in terms of uh, potential yield response here and and of course it's important to recognize that the the yield impact of poor fertilizer application uh, will be impacted by the uh, management strategy of an individual grower and so whether it's uh, P and K or which is shown sort of in the phosphorus response on the left where you've got a a nonlinear yield response or or nitrogen, which has the same sort of characteristics. You know, I think we recognize from pure you know agronomics that there is a point where if we're over applying fertilizer, we're not going to get a yield response. And if we're under applying that fertilizer, we're going to see a negative uh, response. Uh, corn is even a little bit more maybe tricky because depending on the growing season, our yield or economically optimal yield or nitrogen uh, efficiency point is going to be different. Uh, if we have a really high yielding year, uh, we're going to see more risk for nitrogen deficiency if nitrogen starts to become a larger part of the uh, um, uh, limiting factors for that crop production. In the same breath, if we're in a really low yielding condition, then nitrogen's probably not our limiting basis and, and we might not see as much of a, of a stress point uh, from that. So this gets into a bit of understanding as a grower, where am I operating at so I can communicate my risk level to my ag retailer that's applying the fertilizer or that I know it myself, if I'm applying the fertilizer myself. Because if I'm trying to operate or manage my crop very close to an economically optimum rate. I'm maybe doing split applied fertilizer over the course of a year to really try to manage my efficiency. I'm also going to put myself at a greater risk for uh, fertilizer deficiency to show up in, uh, um, in images or in yield um, based on the quality of the spread pattern that, uh, that I create. If we take some of these numbers or sort of general yield responses and put them into the context of, of real application data. So if we have a real you know, W pattern there in terms of our fertilizer distribution, where you know, again, we're getting the right total rate out, but the distribution just isn't perfect, which is shown in the, uh, in, in the top graph there. Um, the, the yield response that we would expect to get is going to uh, mirror, the, the, the low points will mirror. We under apply fertilizer, we're gonna have a negative yield response. But of course, those areas that we over apply fertilizer, we're not gonna, say, we're not gonna see a, a yield benefit that will continue to, uh, to enhance or overcome those deficiencies. So in this case, with a sort of a, a standard 20% you know, COV um, with a W-shaped pattern, we're expect, we, would, we would estimate about a $26 per acre uh, yield impact um, at $5 corn based on the, the losses that we have in those low yielding uh, zones. And likewise, if we have a, uh, an M-shaped pattern, um, this is going to be not as uh, visually uh, impactful because we don't have quite as many low spots. But uh, definitely in this case, we're, we're still going to take about a $20 per acre uh, yield hit. Uh, associate with these uh, with these losses. Now, uh, I'd like to ask a question, you know, is this yield detectable, right? How do we know this is happening? And when we think about how we how we look at yield, right, from a yield map typically, uh, we have to remember that yield maps produce data, one data point per width of combine head. And so in this case, if we're running a, a 12 row combine head, uh, we're going to get two yield data points across the width of this uh, pass that we have, uh, this fertilizer pass we have shown here. So in those cases, we're not going to be able to really document this type of yield loss with yield maps uh, very effectively. Uh, in 2018, I had an insurance company that reached out to me and, uh, and asked, you know, 
essentially said, you know, we're seeing a big uptick in insurance claims around fertilizer application. And they were trying to understand what's changed with application equipment. And my message to them was that nothing's really changed with application equipment. What has changed is, is imagery. And, and at the end of the day, we can't see this type of yield response in our, in our yield maps, but a really quick flyover with a drone, a 10-minute you know, edge of field scouting with a drone can be very effective to identify you know, two, four, six rows of crop that are negatively affected by uh, poor distribution patterns. And, uh, and that's really what's driven the, the greater level of, uh, I would say, awareness and, um, and also some of the challenges around this issue here in the state of Iowa and the greater Midwest over the last, uh, last several years. Okay, so um, I want to talk about uh, avoidable issues, right? Things that we can do as we make application and, and rate decisions, product decisions, that can effectively help us to reduce our risk in, uh, in, this, in this space. Um, by far, number one, the most avoidable issue is making sure that we're pan testing the spread width and the shape of our pattern so that our machines are ready to go to the field. Um, I've made a joke before that the photo here is the, uh, the widest spread pattern ever achieved in Iowa, right? This was a really windy day when lime was being applied and, and uh, you know, we should have been out there that day. We have to be cognizant of the, of the weather conditions um, uh, as well. When it comes to determining how far we can really throw a particle, there's, there's a few things that determine this, right? Number one is the initial speed. So the faster that particle leaves the, the machine, the faster it spins off the spinner spreader, the, the farther that particle is going to go, right? It's like, think about throwing a baseball, right? The faster your arm speed, the farther that ball is going to go. Uh, the second is the height and the trajectory. So if we throw that particle from a higher place off the ground, you know, higher clearance sprayers with dry boxes are going to be able to spread farther than a toad applicator where the spinner spreader is much closer to the ground. So height matters, and then the trajectory. Oftentimes the spinner spreaders are trying to give it a little upward trajectory to get that, that particle to, uh, uh, to spread farther. Uh, mass of the particle matters. Uh, you can throw a baseball uh, or a, uh, you can throw a golf ball much farther than you can throw a ping pong ball, even though they have uh, similar shapes um, based on their differences in, in mass and ultimately the momentum that particle has once it leaves the, uh, uh, the disc. And the last one is the shape of the particle. And um, in general, we have uh, most of our primary fertilizers, uh, phosphorus, potassium, nitrogen, have really good shapes and, uh, and the shape doesn't negatively impact us. But when we start to apply a cover crop or elemental sulfur, sulfur things that aren't shaped as you know, small round particles, uh, all of a sudden that shape does start to, to come into, into play here. Now, when I think about these factors, I think it's really important to note that, that we don't control all of these. So if we're trying to to create a 100 foot or 120 foot spread width off the back of a spinner spreader, uh, we can't just say, let's keep increasing the speed because increasing the speed means our spinners are, are turning faster, they're running harder. Um, with that, when we think about what that means, um, we have to transfer that energy into the particle. And so the particle itself will limit how much speed we can put into it because uh, if we run too fast on a soft particle, it will simply uh, uh, it'll simply break. I like to use a lot of analogies, and and uh, so when I think about that particle size piece and the and the interaction with uh, with uh, the material, I like to think about the egg, the golf ball, and the ping pong ball. And you know, if we're throwing these across the room, you know, you can throw an egg pretty far because. It's got decent mass to it. Uh, it. It weighs a typical egg weighs more than a golf ball. Uh, it's got a pretty good shape to it, so you can you can launch an egg. Uh, you can obviously throw a golf ball pretty far. You can throw a ping pong ball, uh, or you can't throw a ping pong ball very far because of the uh, uh, the limitations and the weight of that material. Uh, of course, you know if we're trying to hit these with a with a golf club, uh, you know that doesn't do very well with an egg, right? Because the material will shatter and break. And we think about that corollary with uh, with fertilizer, um, very similar, right? The egg is urea. 
It's got a, a great particle. Um, it, it will fly quite far, but it tends to be softer. The more energy we put into it, the more likely it is to explode. Just like if we hit that egg hard with a with a uh, uh, with a golf club. Uh, the golf ball, you know, that's your potash, your DAP, your MAP. That's a that's a pretty hard product. You can put a lot of energy into it. It's going to fly quite far, and you're going to get great spread widths. Uh, the ping pong ball, that's your uh, cover crop. That's your elemental sulfur. That's the, the product that uh, really doesn't have the mass and the shape to be able to fly and, and, uh, and spread very uh, effectively. So, you know, tie us all back to this concept of, of striping and field variability. Like thinking of our product involved and doing pan testing, spreader testing based on the primary products that we use is really important because we can't expect that the uh, potash is going to spread exactly like elemental sulfur, urea, uh, rye, cover crop, um, and other products. Like how we set the machine is going to be specific, or the width we're able to even spread that material is going to be specific to the material that we're actually using. And that's what drives that. Uh, calibration of every product every year to to dial in and stay in line with those expectations. So uh, a few photos here. So when we talk about like nitrogen uh, distribution issues, this is a I would say a really common problem where you can see some slight diagonal streaks across that field. Uh, urea in general uh, is not going to uh, spread quite as far as a as a dry potash. And so in this case, um, you know, the, the operator was uh, set up, was intentionally trying to spread uh, 90 feet of swath width, um, but their actual pattern was closer to 85 feet. And so you've got a couple rows between each swath where, where we've got a real yield uh, disadvantage because of that, that uh, lack of nitrogen availability, that under application on those, uh, on those specific rows. Again, um, something that we should have found through pan testing ahead of the, uh, the season and avoided that uh, uh, in season. Now, um, pan testing is uh, not something that's a, a ton of fun. There's a decent amount of work that goes on in this, but it really is the only way to, to effectively um, uh, evaluate the quality of a machine today. Uh, there's a lot of different types of pans on the market. I don't really get too concerned about what type of pans people are using. Uh, usually there's some inserts that go in there that help to sort of dampen or, or reduce bounce of the particles, but you're, you're always going to get some particles that, that, that do bounce out of these machines. Um, when I look at pan testing results, I'm really more focused on what's the pattern look like? What's the width look like? Am I getting consistency across that pattern? Uh, more so than trying to validate the actual tons per acre that were that were applied. You'll notice when we do pan testing, we put multiple pans in a row. Uh, and the reason we do this is to get a larger sample. When we, when we look at the overall sample that's produced here, we want to get as much material per sort of spot in the field as we can, just so that we can visually have a better indication of what's, uh, uh, what's coming and, and uh, what that product looks like. So there's several examples. This is for some real uh, pan testing, some setup that we did this year on a uh, um, uh, on a particular spinner spreader that was uh, uh, had not been previously calibrated. So um, we had an Iowa State team that went out and, and helped set this machine up. Uh, after you pan test, you put that material into uh, individual vials, and then visually we can see what that pattern looks like. We can reference our operating manual for that machine and make some decisions of when we should adjust uh, the overall uh, settings of that machine. Uh, when we do this, we often will use the center of the machine as a blank tube. So you see the one empty tube in the middle. That's intentional, and that's just so that as we're putting material into the vials that we can make sure we remember where the center point was and have a good uh, visual for, for left versus right on the machine. Great example here, we have a center heavy application. We have a lot of material right behind that machine and decreasing amounts as we go uh, both left and right. And so in this case, um, you know, we reference the manual, we understand that we need to make a spinner spreader um, a location adjustment and continue forward with the, next, uh, with the next test. We run it again, and uh, uh, now you're starting to see um, a bit more of a, uh, of a, first of all, a wider spread width 
but also you can see that we've got a heavy distribution on the uh, on the outside. And so we've probably over adjusted this machine and, and need to run another test, make another adjustment until we uh, uh, start to dial it in. Um, and this case, uh, this is actually where we uh, sort of uh, settled in terms of final uh, settings on the machine. You'll notice that there's still a slight W pattern. The, the uh, first vial outside the center and also the next to last one are both a little bit heavy. There's a slight um, you know, W pattern that still exists. And uh, ultimately this becomes a, um, you know, a trade-off of, of, of time and uh, you know, complexity of adjustments. Um, that's why we continue to, to do a COV check uh, do the math on on our variability across the machine, and uh, you know we'll ultimately continue to test until we get that COV uh, below twenty percent for that uh, for that applicator. Now, a few things about identifying some problems. This was a, a unique problem that that we ran into um, again this year and on a on a on a different machine. Uh, in this case, the pattern from left to right looked very different. Uh, you can see on the left, we have um, more of an even uh, distribution of, of, uh, of product versus on the right, we had a product that was actually going farther, but also a different sort of mix of, of fines and, and, uh, and, and large particles. So we made an adjustment and we really couldn't um, manipulate or we really couldn't fix this based on the standard adjustments. And uh, in this case, what was uh, what triggered some additional evaluation was the fact that we really were seeing a lot of fines on the right side of the machine versus the left side of the machine. And uh, in this case, it turned out to be a, a, a bad sensor installation. The speed sensor of the of the spinner spreader uh, was only picking up uh, every other pulse as it uh, rotated. And so, uh, as a result, that spinner spreader on the on one side of the machine was just running a lot faster. And when it does that, this is a great example of how that, that speed is really impacting the product quality. And so the both the mass of the material and the, the formulation of that material, the quality of that material is changing um, you know, based on that, that, uh, that setting issue. Uh, we couldn't see this from the cab. The cab told us everything was running, uh, running accurately. And so, you know, the key here is, or the message here is, you know, without pan testing, again, particularly at the up front of the year, to make sure we catch those sort of uh, rust gremlins or sensor gremlins that, that, that pop up over the winter, um, we could have had some real problems with releasing this machine to the field for an entire season and having uh, uh, some really, really poor distribution problems and, and uh, again, um, things that are, are pretty easy to catch from, uh, from UAV imagery. Okay, the second issue I want to talk about and is an avoidable mistake is making reasonable rate changes across the field. So this video out of the is of a of a spinner spreader, you know, running across the field and you can see that we've got material essentially pouring out of the back, hitting those discs and then getting flung out uh, through each individual uh, rotation with each individual uh, set of fins. And um, you know why rate matters is because it's 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 common to make a variable rate map where we might have a four x difference about around the amount of product applied in different parts of the field. You may be putting down fifty pounds per acre in one part of the field, and two hundred or three hundred or four hundred pounds per acre in a different part of the field, uh, based on soil sampling recommendations. As we really change the rate of material that enters the spinner spreaders, uh, the spinner spreaders need to be adjusted to be able to handle those types of, of uh, rate changes, or it will commonly impact the distribution pattern that we, uh, that we see. So uh, here's an example. I'm gonna show you some data from some urea testing that we've done in the past, uh, looking at essentially um, 50, 100, and 200 pounds per acre of uh, of, of urea, this, this basically maps out to uh, 25, 50, and 100 pounds of, of effective nitrogen. So, you know, rates that you would you would expect or would be fairly common for a, a top dress or a second pass uh, urea application. When we start with the, the low rate of urea, and we've got multiple reps of this, 
um, you know, this is a pretty flat pattern. This is this is a little higher than our, our 20% uh, CFV target, but this really isn't that bad. It's got a pretty consistent pattern across the, uh, the center. And then of course, since we're overlapping the passes, those round off uh, corners there from about 30 feet out, we're gonna we're gonna uh, get those up to the right rate once the next pass comes uh, across the field. We go to the uh, 100 pounds per acre, 108 pounds of of, uh, of urea. You can start to see that now because of the rate change, we didn't change anything else on the machine, but because of the rate change, we're starting to see more of a W pattern be uh, uh, be formed. And then we go up to the highest one, the 216 pounds of urea. We've really got a substantial or significant, um, you know, W pattern starting to form in that machine, and the COV starts to to get away from us. So we can manage this, right? We we can manage this based on recommendations that we make when we're setting up a variable rate fertilizer map, being thoughtful of the fact that if we make significant changes in the the rate across the field it will absolutely uh, impact that spreader and pattern if we don't make any other changes. Now, um, if we look at this comparison, right, this is a, a very traditional sort of response with a spinner spreader when no other adjustments are made. Um, um, let's compare this now against an air boom and look at some of the pro-con differences of what you get with an air boom, uh, which is, is frankly um, more suitable to handle these types of, of large uh, change adjustments. Um, before we go there, I do want to mention that uh, uh, we have a lot of innovation happening in the space. And uh, one of these innovations from an Iowa company, New Leader, who um, you know, provides a lot of the spinner spreader boxes that are out here in the market. And um, one of the more recent innovations in these uh, spinner spreaders is to allow us to do a calibration that will uh, calibrate the machine across multiple rates. Uh, this takes more time. It's more set up early in the season, but essentially this uh, calibration technique and the controls that New Leader provides in the space uh, do allow us to um, adjust the machine automatically uh, across these rate changes and, uh, and, um, and, and do a better job of maintaining these rate shifts and differences. So if you're a spinner spreader user and you're um, and you know you're going to have you know pretty aggressive rate changes, uh, utilizing some of the newer technology that's better suited for these rate changes uh, is definitely going to be advantageous or help you to mitigate uh, the risk that you're going to see on your fields or with your customers. Okay, let's look at the same situation with a uh, with a pneumatic applicator. Um, talking about the same kind of rates, the 50, 100, 200 pounds of of, uh, of applied urea, and um, you know we're going to expect to see on these machines a much more consistent application. So you know we get that out of the gate. Um, the low rate, we've got a COV of 18%. That's really pretty good. We've got a nice flat pattern across that that applicator. Uh, we go to the 100 pound application rate, and we get a little bit worse, 20%, but still very very good. Um, you get up to uh, the higher rate, the 200 pounds per acre. Um, we start to see a little heavy distribution at the center, but but again, overall, you know, fairly limited influence of changes in um, application rate on the impact of the uh, of the distribution. Uh, pneumatic applicators are simply known for for being quite consistent as we change rates and as we change products across the field. Uh, so again, although they are more expensive and they have some maybe some additional uh, maintenance challenges, um, they have a place. And if you're sensitive about your uh, application quality, if you know that you're trying to run pretty close to the uh, optimal rate on fertilizer, uh, these products, the pneumatic products, have a, a real chance to to uh, to be uh, advantaged for you. Um, although you may pay a little bit more for that application to happen because you're going to get a different quality uh, of product out. We compare these again against the uh, the flat applicator, the, the spinner spreaders, and, and uh, yeah, we're just going to expect to see that fairly consistent uh, flat response. And, um, you know, they also do very well when we start to mix different products together, um, particularly if you're trying to apply you know, a cover crop with a with a potash material that are are really quite different in their uh, in their product qualities. 
<clears throat> All right, the third avoidable issue is to watch for changes in material quality and for changes in your environment. And here we're specifically talking about wind uh, that can impact our, our ability. Um, <clears throat> there's, there's a couple different ways that we can evaluate overall uh, product quality. Uh, two of them that are most common is an SGN test, which is a, a really simple uh, hand screen that uh, we can quickly take a look at the uh, um, the size variability of our fertilizers to make sure those aren't changing over time. Uh, you start by by filling up the right side of this uh, this SGN tester. You shake the tester in order to uh, work material through the screens. And then ultimately it gives you a volumetric percentage of the amount of material you have per each uh, individual size. Uh, this is really useful to be able to capture when things are changing on you, uh, particularly as you go through batches and batches and batches of fertilizer from a retailer or a depot, and the source of those materials may be different, the quality may be different, the number of times they've been handled may be different. Uh, all of that can be uh, really helpful to know you know, when you should maybe pause, uh, think about doing another pan test, or at least be a little bit more risk averse in your, uh, your approach if you have a shift in, uh, in product quality. On the right, we've got uh, a picture of, uh, of a breakage test where we use a, a simple crush tester to, to measure the particle um, uh, characteristics. Again, great example here would be urea where you know, it's, gonna, it's gonna break down quite a bit faster or have lower strength ratings. And uh, monitoring that, keeping an eye on that is gonna help us make sure that we um, you know, do a good job adjusting over time. If we look at uh, an example of a high quality versus low quality urea, you'll see that on the left and that high quality material, um, really we're talking about material that's gonna fall into two, maybe three different bins, but gonna be pretty closely um, linked. On the right, you've got a material that's got a lot more fines in it. It's had some damage that's happened over time. And all of a sudden you've got material that has shown up in every single bin of that uh, quality test. Uh, that's a red flag. We need to be thoughtful of how that material is applied or whether we should be even you know, be applying that with a spinner spreader uh, because of the quality issues that are gonna likely show up there. When we try to spread that low quality material, uh, we usually get a really high center distribution. And that's because the fines uh, they just don't they don't fly very far. They have really low density. They're really impacted by by wind and air resistance, and so it's uh, it's not something you really change or a setting you can adjust in your machine to fix this. Um, you're really simply at the at at the risk or of of uh, of product quality being the limiting factor. All right, number four is is uh, avoidable issues is making sure we're thoughtful of the type of material blends that we're using. In spinner spreaders and in pneumatic spreaders, it's common today to be able to have multiple bins in an applicator. So, you know, we might be blending material at a, at a retailer and putting a blended product in a single tank, or we may be putting two different products, three different products in that applicator at the same time. And, uh, you know, the key here is to be thinking about how the properties of the material are gonna influence the, the quality and to be thoughtful and avoid situations where we're, we're mixing materials that are really different in their product quality. I wanna show some examples of uh, some colleagues at Ohio State University that have done some testing with um, both potash and DAP mixed together. And this would be a you know, pretty common type of mixture trying to get both P and K out at the same time. Um, they were doing spinner spreader testing. And after they pan tested, they, they took the material from the pans and then physically separated the potash particles from the DAP particles in order to be able to, to sort of, even though they were spread at the same time, to be able to get a, uh, the pattern differences. And uh, this first graph is when they're independently metered. So they're in separate bins and they're fed individually uh, uh, through those separate bins into the spinner spreaders. And what's great here is that we really don't see a pattern shift. We don't see a difference in the red bars and the, and the gray bars in a significant way. We get generally the fairly similar pattern out, uh, which gives us confidence we can, we can do this with uh, uh, mixed blended products. They repeated this test where they blended it at the retailer prior to application and really got similar results. And so to me, the key here is that, that uh, you know, blending product is absolutely something we can, we can do. 
Uh, we just have to be thoughtful of the products that we're blending. Potash and DAP are very similar types of uh, uh, products, and uh, we'd expect those to, to work fairly well together. But when we're looking at the range of things that we apply, um, that isn't always the case. You know, if we mix a cover crop seed with a, with a, with a, a fall dry fertilizer, that's not going to work very well, right? Those, those light, small grain seeds um, have, a, have a really odd shape to them. They really don't do a very good job of, of flying through the air. Um, they don't take momentum very well. And, uh, and, and we're going to get striping differences relative to our, our potash or MAP or, or more hardy uh, fertilizers. LML sulfur is the same way. LML sulfur is, is kind of like taking a Frisbee and throwing it into the wind uh, face first. Uh, it just has some, some challenges in terms of the weight and the particle shape that prevent it from, uh, uh, from, from effectively being you know, blended with a potash and then expecting that to have similar type of, uh, of spread patterns between those. So you know, blending's great as long as we're, we're dealing with products that have similar types of of shape, size, and, uh, and strength characteristics. Uh, sulfur has been something that, that probably shows up as much as any. These are some example photos of, of sulfur distribution issues. Uh, again, elemental sulfur in particular just is, is fairly difficult to do a, a decent job of, of, uh, of spreading. And, uh, and as a result, and, and because corn is, uh, if, you, if you have a sulfur deficiency, corn is pretty visibly um, uh, responsive to that, uh, they show up pretty easily on, on uh, these types of UAV uh, images. All right, the, uh, the last point I want to mention here about avoidable issues is to be thoughtful of your guidance paths. With um, uh, nitrogen and sulfur deficiencies, it's really pretty easy to see these that happen in the same year of the application. Uh, P and K deficiencies are less likely to show up during the application year, um, and so we don't have as many reportable issues with P and K. Uh, that doesn't mean, though, that poor distribution isn't happening. It just means it's not yet expressed by the plants, um, you know, because of the nature of P and K deficiencies versus uh, maybe nitrogen and sulfur deficiencies. Um, it is recommended, though, to make sure that if you're applying and using, you know, auto steer guidance lines, that you think about varying the direction of travel, varying the, the center point of your guidance lines across the field so that year after year after year, you avoid applying the same W-shaped pattern in the exact same spot of the field. Uh, by avoiding that, you have an opportunity to you know, further uh, mix and reduce the, the likelihood of those kind of deficiencies that, that do pop up in, in very specific uh, uh, areas. Um, this is just more examples of, of some challenging sort of conditions. This was a, a lime distribution um, you know, on a windy day uh, here in, in, uh, in the last uh, really few weeks in central Iowa. And um, again, you know, this, uh, this is probably you know, an issue that, that you know, is, a, is a lose, lose, lose for everybody, right? The, the retailer is not happy with the job it's done. The farmer is not happy with the job it's done. The uh, agronomists who, you know, help with soil sampling and creating a plan aren't, aren't happy with the job it's done. Um, and so, taking the time to to think about, you know, is this really the right day to do the application? And that goes both ways. As a, as a grower, we have to be thoughtful of: Are we asking for something? Are we pressuring our retailer to get work done when it really just isn't the right weather conditions to go out and uh, and do that. So I'm going to leave you with a handful of tips. I'm going to, I'm going to have one slide here that, that really focuses on tips for growers and one slide that focuses on tips for ag retailers. Uh, for growers, I encourage you to do several things, right? Think about uh, reasonable variable rate maps. If you're, uh, if you're really aggressive with your variable rate plans, you should think about how your applicator is going to respond to that. If you're Putting on application rates that have a lot of difference, three, four, five X changes in the amount of fertilizer, you really th should think about using uh, air booms over spinner spreaders uh, or make sure that your spinner spreader is a newer model with some of the advanced technology that exists today to be able to help to mitigate the pattern changes associated with those uh, um, uh, spread, spread pattern shifts. 
uh, work with your ag retailer on weather timing of applications, right? I've, we've heard horror stories about producers that, that are really pressuring fertilizer application to be done when the weather conditions aren't great. And then uh, on the flip side, being upset about, you know, the, the fact it didn't go well, right? And uh, there's a balance here, right? We want to put our retailers, our applicators in the right situation to do a great job. And, and weather, particularly wind, is something we need to be cognizant of. Um, communicate your risk. If you're particularly uh, aggressive with your strategy for nitrogen management, you want to make sure you're communicating that to whoever's applying so they know that uh, you know, you're really paying attention to this and you really uh, have there's a yield element here that you're um, you know, you're expecting to have really high quality uh, distribution, particularly of, of NNS products. Uh, be willing or aware that air boom applications cost more. And so if you need more precision, you may have to pay a higher price for that application cost uh, because of the, the, the cost of, of uh, um, uh, precision that's delivered. And then utilize imagery. Uh, drones are becoming increasingly more available, increasingly less cost. And all the photos that I showed here don't require any level of, of, uh, of geoprocessing or, 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 or uh, map stitching. They're simply really uh, simple photos of putting a drone up in the air, getting a few hundred feet across above a field, and taking a few photos. And understanding are the things that we're doing in our management that are uh, limiting our overall quality. Um, similarly, if you're an ag retailer, uh, I think it's a different kind of set of responsibilities here, but, but also uh, important to make sure that, that you're meeting your end of the bargain of having all your machines pan tested making sure they're, they're ready for the kind of fertilizers and application rates that you're dealing with on a year-to-year -year basis. Uh, be thoughtful of in-field rate changes, right? Particularly if you start seeing these higher rate shifts, you know, understand that will change the pattern and are your machines ready for that? Are your, do your operators know how to manage that uh, to avoid a, uh, a significant issue? Uh, know your customers. You know, you know, you know customers that are that are managing more closely their inflection point on fertility, customers that are more susceptible to pattern inaccuracies. Um, you know, make good decisions so that you put that customer into a, uh, into the um, the best situation they can be in. And then finally, you know, based on those rate changes, based on the precision required, uh, make sure you're you're leveraging air booms. They may not be you know the majority of your fleet but make sure you're leveraging air booms when needed to achieve those uh, higher precision applications. Uh, with that, I'm gonna wrap up and, and it's been a, an honor to have a chance to talk to you about these uh, particular topics. Uh, always love to have uh, comments and feedback. So uh, again, my name's uh, Matt Dar uh, in Ag Engineering here at Iowa State and, and uh, we'll be happy to connect with you if you've got more questions on, on this or other topics in the precision fertilizer uh, space. Thank you.